ready to, quote, go to war against President Trump's opponents in Congress, in the media, and in corporate America. In Washington with the details on the White House reset is John Roberts. John? Kimberly, good evening to you. And we're just uh, getting uh, at this hour uh, a little bit of a different uh, timeline here than we had originally. Originally, it looked like John Kelly was doing a review of all of the positions at the White House, in particular Steve Bannon's, and that maybe Kelly was looking at him as not the sort of person that he wanted to have on the team. And, and that may still be true. But now we're learning from an actual White House official, and this is not sources from the outside, which were the initial source of this, uh, hearing from a White House official that Steve Bannon, in fact, tendered his resignation to the president back on August the 7th. Now, again, it may be that there was discussions with John Kelly back then, as he was pretty much brand new as the chief of staff, that perhaps uh, Steve Bannon wouldn't hang around or that uh, President Trump had indicated to Steve Bannon that he expected that he was going to leave at some point. Or it may be just that Steve Bannon thought that his time had come to an end and that it was time to leave. But that would seem to argue against the notion that Steve Bannon was fired by the president today or fired by the chief of staff if, in fact, he offered his resignation, as a White House source says, uh, back on the 7th. But here's the official take from the White House. Quote, White House Chief of Staff John Kelly and Steve Bannon have mutually agreed today would be Steve's last day. We are grateful for his service and we wish him the best. It's uh, no question that the president is going to lose a close ally ideologically at the very east, at least with Steve Bannon's departure. But all indications are that when Bannon leaves the White House, he will continue to work on behalf of the president and may actually continue to work against uh, and maybe even more vigorously against the establishment uh, section of the Republican Party uh, that he clearly was at odds with during his time inside the White House, Kimberly. All right, John Roberts, thank you for that update. And here now with more on Steve Bannon exiting the White House is Ed Henry. Ed? Kimberly, a dramatic day here at the White House, even though President Trump uh, was at Camp David for a national security meeting and then back to New Jersey uh, to his golf club on this working vacation. Steve Bannon out, as you suggested. Uh, General John Kelly, the new chief of staff, clearly trying again to bring some order around here. He put out a very terse statement saying that there was mutual agreement between Kelly and Bannon, that it was time for him to go, and he wished him well in the future. And I can tell you that Bannon wasted did absolutely no time going right back to the conservative news site Breitbart. In fact, just hours after he left the White House, he was chairing their nightly editorial meeting, we're told, right back in the driver's seat of that news organization. Now, there's a narrative taking hold in the mainstream media that somehow Bannon is going to be waging war against President Trump by using Breitbart to go after the president, but a source close to Bannon insisted to me today that that is not true and that Bannon is 100 percent behind the president. In fact, Bannon did an interview with Bloomberg News saying in part, quote, if there's any confusion out there, let me clear it up. I'm leaving the White House and going to war for Trump against his opponents on Capitol Hill, in the media and in corporate America. And then later in a, an interview with the Weekly Standard, Bannon says, quote, the Trump presidency that we fought for and won is over. We still have a huge movement and we will make something of this Trump presidency. But that presidency is over. It'll be something else. And there'll be all kinds of fights and there will be good days and bad days. But that presidency is over, at least suggesting that phase of the Trump presidency is over. What comes now? I can tell you in talking to senior Republicans today, not just here at the White House, but on Capitol Hill as well, they want to see an end to the palace intrigue, the speculation, and they want to see the president get back on his agenda, tax cuts and all of the rest. Here's Republican Congressman Lee Zeldin. If the president is making changes to the chemistry where people know each other's strengths and weaknesses and they're getting the legislative agenda passed and they're moving the economy forward and accomplishing the president's priorities, uh, that's all good. And, and I'm one, I'm a congressional Republican who supports our president, who wants him to be successful. I'm getting tax reform across the finish line, for example, over the course of these next couple months, uh, it's a highest priority regardless of who's in the West Wing with the president. There are a lot of people here at the White House who want to see the president get back to that agenda. 
tax cuts, infrastructure, another uh, bite of the apple perhaps in terms of repealing and replacing Obamacare. Bannon had fallen out of favor with the president in part because of that book he had participated with, uh, cooperated with recently suggesting that maybe Bannon had just as much as the president had to do uh, with that big election victory last year over Hillary Clinton. The president at that now famous news conference at Trump Tower on Tuesday made it clear that he beat out all of the other Republicans' candidates in the primary and was the leader uh, of this movement that beat Clinton and now wants to get back aggressively to that legislative agenda. Kimberly? All right, Ed Henry, thank you so much. And joining us now with reaction is former presidential candidate and former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, Governor Huckabee. And really, um, kind of a little bit of a you know, startling news here because there has been a lot of uh, you know tumultuous nature in terms of what's been going on with the administration. But many saying tonight that Steve Bannon's departure really amounts to a reset for the White House. Your thoughts? I'm not sure that it's a, a reset for the White House. The, 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 this is a White House that has a very specific mission uh, to secure America's borders, to change our trade laws, to lower taxes, to give religious liberty to Americans. That's the architectural plan. The fact that some carpenters come and go on the job site doesn't change the design of the construction. And I think everybody gets all excited about who comes, who goes. Look, it's the president's agenda, and everyone who who works there, including my own daughter, work at the pleasure of the president. And if for any reason he doesn't have that pleasure, then those folks uh, will simply move on. And it doesn't mean that the presidency of this president is in any way jeopardized. Okay, well, Newt Gingrich has been uh, quoted as saying President Trump needs to make some serious changes to his presidency. Would you agree with that statement? Well, I think General Kelly certainly is a great addition to bring some uh, order in terms of access to the president, focus on the message. And, and let me be honest, I think that the, the president needs to focus on getting tax reform done, staying with his agenda of border security and the trade deals, and not let himself get taken away uh, and caught up with responding to uh, every media slight. Because the truth is, Kimberly, I don't care what he says. The media is never going to like him. They're never going to give him a fair shake. And he needs to just uh, squirt some uh, deep woods off all over himself. <laughs> and don't swat at the mosquitoes because they're not going to get any better, ever. They're Go just not. Yeah. Governor, Stay what about with the, his agenda, what focus about the, upon it, and forget mm -hmm. these guys. What about the timing of this? Because now there are some reports that uh, Mr. Bannon resigned uh, two weeks ago. And then, of course, we know what we've been covering a lot in the news is Charlottesville and the aftermath and a lot of you know, criticism of the president about the timing of when he spoke out on that. Uh, do you think the two have any connection in terms of the departure of Mr. Bannon and the events that transpired in Charlottesville? You know, the honest answer for me is I don't know. Uh, it's some inside baseball stuff. I don't know that it matters, though. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact is Steve Bannon is, is going to be gone. I think he'll still serve the president. But, Kimberly, let me bring up something I haven't heard anyone talk about in all this week of bad publicity for Donald Trump. You know one group of people that have stuck with him? Absolutely. His faith council. The people who surround him from the evangelical community mm -hmm. who were very instrumental in his election, they have not wavered. They have not in any way stumbled. And I think that he should step back and take a look and realize that he has some real key supporters who are good and decent people who are sticking with him because they do believe uh, that he represents for them uh, a protection of religious liberty and also an agenda uh, that helps to get America back on track. And that ought to be something that maybe the mainstream media could maybe pick up on. But mm -hmm. then again... Uh, that would be delusional to think that they might actually get the story right. Well, you brought up a great point here, indeed. And they were a core constituency and a pivotal one for the president during his campaign and in securing the White House. And they have remained steadfast in their support and their faith in him. Governor Huckabee, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And here now with more reaction, former deputy campaign manager for Trump, David Bossy. Dave, thank you so much for being with us tonight. This is, uh, you know, probably a little bit of difficult news for you to hear. I know that you have a close relationship um, with Steve Bannon. Were you able to speak to him today and get your thoughts sort of on what's transpired? Well, Kimberly, thanks for having me. And yeah, I, I, I did speak to uh, Steve a couple of times, a few times today. Uh, he's in great spirits. Uh, he is completely 100% 
committed uh, to helping President Trump get his conservative populist agenda through Congress and to enact those promises uh, that President Trump made uh, on the campaign trail. Those that Steve Bannon was keeping track of inside the White House, uh, you know, on a daily basis and trying to stay true to those conservative principles. And I think that um, Steve, whether he's inside the White House or outside, uh, is going to continue to do just that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what about the fact that there was sort of this push-pull inside the White House between sort of the populist agenda and those that were perceived as globalists, and specifically there was discussion about a battle um, currently between Steve Bannon and H.R. McMaster and perhaps even John Kelly? Well, look, the inside baseball, the, the inside battles that, that were going on are over now uh, with Steve's departure. Uh, from the White House, you know, now General Kelly, now the chief of staff, uh, will continue to create his staff uh, that will be uh, reportable to him and accountable to him. And I think that uh, that's what General Kelly came in to do. Uh, he has been very uh, surgical in trying to put together the staff that he believes will, will work for him. Uh, one of the things they have to do is make sure that they are staying true to the Trump agenda. Mm -hmm. And as long as they do that, they will succeed. But, but the inside baseball, uh, you know, games, they're going to continue. Sure. You know, Steve, I, let me, and I just will say one thing. Steve came into the campaign and it was a, you know, it was a, the campaign was incredibly uh, in, in a tough spot. And, and Steve helped right that ship and help mm -hmm. uh, get it across the finish line. And he was not part of a problem there. And I, I think he gets a lot of bad press, uh, you know, for, for being a disruptor when he's a disruptor of the establishment, not of people he's working with. Do you think that um, the past news cycle of what's transpired in Charlottesville, also the book, The Devil's Bargain, and perhaps even the recent um, article uh, with a, a journalist where Steve Bannon is quoted, had anything to do in terms of putting a little fuel on the fire? Yeah, I really don't, Kimberly. Mm -hmm. What what I what I see, uh, what I know happened was that he did uh, tender uh, his resignation to General Kelly back, I believe, on the seventh or the ninth, and that he was. Um, so when Kelly came in, that's right, and so, to give the general an opportunity to have a clean slate. And mm -hmm. I think Steve is an honorable man, but they decided that you know earlier this week was going to be. Um, Steve's last day, but they put that off because of Charlottesville, and they Certainly. put it off because they didn't want to have even a bigger disruption during some chaotic days. And I think that this is a Friday afternoon is just as good a day as any once once it's been established that he's leaving. Yeah, no, I don't know. You remember back when this all started during the campaign and then during inauguration. It was my understanding at that time, back in January, that Steve Bannon was planning on serving and being there basically through Labor Day to really get right. the president started and to, you know, help with the president's agenda and get him in a secure spot, that it was never his intention or desire to be a, you know, career politician <laughs> or stay in the That's administration. Right. Yeah, you know, I've worked with Steve for about 12 years now. I've, mm -hmm. I've been a business partner with Steve Bannon for about 12 years. Uh, he's never come across for one minute as a staffer to me. Right. And so, so I, I just, you know, he is somebody who was dedicated to this president, will continue to be dedicated to this president's uh, conservative reform agenda. Right, and is somebody, yeah. and is somebody who's going to continue to help him, and and I think be very, be a very powerful, positive force from the outside. So you won't expect anything in terms of criticism. A lot of people fearful that are supportive of the president, that Bannon, who was a very powerful adversary and also a very powerful ally when he's on your side, will not become adversarial with the president and uh, using Breitbart, etc., to make attacks from the outside. Oh, I completely. Uh, believe that that's hogwash. They, okay. th that is never going to happen. Is Steve Bannon is an honorable uh, soldier uh, mm -hmm. in in our effort, and and somebody who is uh, going to, as I said, lift up the president's agenda. Now, if he has policy disagreements with people inside the White House, where he was handcuffed while he was inside the White House, it's a different ball game. He's yeah. a, it's a different ball game now, and he may not have those same handcuffs as it relates to individuals inside the White House who he doesn't believe carries the president's agenda wholeheartedly. All right. Well, you have my full attention. I speak bossy, and I know what that means. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. It's good to have you here tonight.
And coming up, more reaction to tonight's breaking news. Steve Bannon is out as White House Chief Strategist. Sarah Carter and Charlie Hurd weigh in next. That and much more on this special edition of Hannity as we continue. I like Mr. Bannon. He's a friend of mine. But Mr. Bannon came on very late. You know that. I went through 17 senators, governors, and I won all the primaries. Mr. Bannon came on very much later than that. Uh, and I like him. He's a good man. Uh, he is not a racist. I can tell you that. He's a good person. He actually gets a very unfair press in that regard. But we'll see what happens with Mr. Bannon. Welcome back to Hannity, and that was President Trump earlier this week calling Steve Bannon a friend. Sarah Carter with Circa News spoke with Bannon earlier this morning, and she is reporting that Bannon said he resigned from his White House post about two weeks ago. Sarah joins us now along with Fox News contributor Charlie Hurt. So, Sarah, I want to begin with you, and you confirmed today that Steve Bannon offered his resignation two weeks ago. How did this all play out, and what have you heard about why he resigned? Well, he offered his resignation, according to Mr. Bannon, two weeks ago, and he, you know, he had always said, and he told me this, that from the beginning, he never planned on being uh, at the White House more than eight months to a year, and right. uh, August 14th was the year mark for him, and he was he was ready to move on. Uh, and I also think that, you know, he's, he's at a point where he can. We've seen this big turnover, you know, at the White House. Uh, there's a restructuring of people within the White House, and General Kelly is there now, and he, uh, you know, he's taking the helm. And this was a way for Mr. Bannon to kind of move on with what he would like to do and 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 give that space uh, so Kelly can do what he needs to do. Okay, so did you call him this morning or he phoned you? I and mean, how did this come about? Yeah, so I did. I, I contacted him directly as, you know, the rumors were swirling around for, for more than a week now. And I, you know, wanted to know what was going on. And I just asked him straight up, are these rumors true? What's going on? And can you talk? And uh, he very frankly told me, yes, Sarah, that is correct. I gave my letter of resignation two weeks ago. And, you know, Kimberly, we're hearing all of these stories uh, that he was fired, that he was pushed out. I actually heard from sources that the president was trying to figure out a way to keep him on board. But, you know, both of them had come to this realization that this was probably what he needed to do. So uh, it's just interesting to hear all the rumors. I, I wanted to talk to the people directly, and that's what I did. And unfortunately, Mr. Bannon was willing to talk to me. Okay, is he going to make that letter of resignation public that he resigned, in fact, two weeks ago? Because we haven't had any White House sources thus far up until this point uh, confirming that. That's right. Um, I'm hoping so. Uh, I don't think he's going to do that just yet. But I, I think he will make that letter available uh, in the near future. And, you know, I, I don't think he's the kind of man that will do things quietly. He'll definitely come forward and, uh, and let people know what he's doing. Charlie, I'll bring you in because there was discussion in the past when there were bumpy times, uh, tumultuous times with Priebus, with Bannon, and the Mercers very strongly backed Steve Bannon with the president to help secure and stabilize and maintain his tenure in uh, the White House. So that is a very strong alliance that going forward, you think it's one that will be positive and supportive to the president and his administration? Oh, I think without a doubt it, it will absolutely be supportive. You know, uh, Donald Trump didn't arrive at these uh, political positions uh, on a lark. Uh, uh, Steve Bannon certainly didn't arrive at his political positions on a lark. Uh, and I think that it's in uh, very much uh, in both of their best interests to continue, uh, you know, pushing forward. Uh, Steve Bannon has a lot to be proud of today. Uh, he helped get Donald Trump elected. Uh, he, before that, he gave a tremendous voice to millions of Americans who had been kind of left out of the political process for a very long time. Steve Bannon, I know, remains completely uh, uh, committed to that agenda, which is now the Trump agenda. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I don't think that we're going to see uh, Steve Bannon do anything but uh, try to, you know, put his shoulder to the wheel. And, and, and you know, and, and, Donald, and, and Steve Bannon inside the White House, he's not an establishment guy. He's not an insider guy. He, he's, he's best when he's a barbarian at the gate mm -hmm. and, he's, uh, and, and he's leading an army of crusaders trying to get something done. That's where he is best. And I think in a lot of ways uh, doing what he, we're going to see him do over the next three years, I think that he will uh, prove to be tremendously effective, every bit as effective as he was before he joined the Trump campaign. 
Mm -hmm. Well, he's certainly a successful man. He's been able to, uh, you know, be successful in a number of different ventures besides politics. Um, so now, what about the fact that there was sort of this push-pull and this sort of battle within the White House with the populists versus the globalists? Mm -hmm. There was a lot of discussion recently in the press about the battle between Steve Bannon and um, H.R. McMaster. Yeah, and I, I don't, and I don't think that just because Steve Bannon leaves that that uh, that. that 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 wing of the of the debate is is going to lose. You know, uh, uh, Donald Trump believes these things because he believes them. He knows that they're right. Mm -hmm. And whether it's on uh, you know climate change or uh, international trade or illegal immigration or fighting terrorism, all of these things, he has not budged from what, what you know the center of what his commitments were to the voters and that's why I, I so if, so what Steve Bannon departs I don't think that that means that Donald Trump is going to renege on any of those things I think he's going to remain I think he's going to remain every bit mm -hmm. as committed to those things as he was uh, if if Steve Bannon never left Sarah there was discussion that the president was upset about the book that came out um, discussing you know Steve Bannon and then the article that came out that he didn't think he was giving an interview um, some of the comments there when you you look at this and kind of put it and frame it in the lens of what has happened in terms of the arguments and what's been going forward in this country about uh, white supremacy and nationalists. Do you think any of that, that emotional rhetoric and that charged environment had anything to hasten the demise and departure of Mr. Bannon? You know, I would only be guessing, Kimberly, if, if I said that, because I haven't had a chance to speak with the president about about that. But it, it could have played a role in there. Look, I think the bigger issue really uh, within the White House was this kind of ideolog ideological uh, break that people had as far as like the Iran deal. That was huge. And, you know, McMaster and, and Bannon butted heads over and over again with that. China was another big issue, which is why he talked to American Prospect, I think, and gave that very kind of stunning interview uh, and remember he contacted them they didn't contact him he he just gave up that information yeah. so I think a lot of the issues there are just really policy and ideology how do we move forward with foreign policy Certainly. national policy and I, I think that remains to be seen and I think President Trump is you know going to keep a very watchful eye on what goes on within the White House and and see how these policies kind of evolve remember the Iran deal comes up for reauthorization again in September and I think it'll be interesting to see whether he reauthorizes that again or not and uh, whether McMaster is able to push him in that direction and whether Secretary of State Tillerson will do the same so I think that's something to be mindful of okay all right well thank you both for being on the program always a pleasure yeah. And coming up, the left and liberals in the mainstream media are losing their collective minds over President Trump's response to Charlottesville. Lieutenant Colonel Alan West will have reaction next on this special edition of Hannity. Welcome back to this special edition of Hannity. The left continues its crusade to take down President Trump. Former Vice President Al Gore is calling for President Trump to resign. And some members of the mainstream media are also trying to gin up outrage and are making things a lot worse. Here's just a few of the latest examples. Watch. I'm an optimist. I have never been as discouraged as I have been this week about our country. Yeah, we're probably seems that we're at a low point in American history. Last month, the president well, compared Well, Civil War was probably yeah, was a little bad. worse. That was bad. Well, I'm worried about what's coming. Great uh, Depression, pretty Lincoln. bad. Pretty bad. That was probably worse. This is a pretty low point. We're going to start taking down every monument that pays tribute to racists. We should probably take down every building with the name Trump on it, you know? <laughs> And yesterday, CNN's Wolf Blitzer questioned whether the Barcelona terror attack was a copycat of what happened in Charlottesville. Watch this. There will be questions about copycats. There will be questions if uh, what happened uh, in Barcelona uh, was at all, at all, uh, a copycat version of what happened in Charlottesville, Virginia, even though there may be different characters, different political ambitions. Uh, they use uh, the, same, uh, the same killing device, a vehicle going at, at high speed, into a group, a large group of pedestrians. And joining us now with reaction, Fox News contributor, Lieutenant Colonel Alan West. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel West, you recently wrote that you found it rather odd that so many people were trying to blame President Trump for what happened in Charlottesville. Why do you feel that way? Well, I just, and it's good to be with you, Kimberly. What I find very interesting is that everything now has to come back to white supremacists. Everything now has to be about racism. 
you know, I was listening to some of the clips that you were playing. You know, a low point for me during the Obama administration, when we knew that we had a president, we had a secretary of state, we had a national security advisor that had abandoned Americans to die during an Islamic terrorist attack, and then they lied about it. And nothing was ever done. No one ever remembers those four Americans who lost their lives and the family members who were shunned. And so when I think about someone like a Wolf Blitzer, obviously he's quite delusional. He has not been around for quite some time because the terrorists have been using this vehicular attack, this terrorist-style attack, right. going back to Bastille Day in Nice, France, going back to what happened at the German uh, Christmas market, going back just recently is what we have seen happen in England. So again, everything has to be about what their uh, message du jour is right now, is everyone is a white supremacist, everyone is a neo-Nazi or Klan member, as long as they don't agree with their agenda. And what I do find interesting is that you have someone like Maxine Waters and others in the Democrat Party mm -hmm. who so fight for Planned Parenthood, but yet Margaret Sanger was an incredibly well-known white supremacist. Unbelievable. Really, when you examine the facts and the historical record, it tells quite a different tale. And just to dovetail on, you know, your comments here, I mean, you have a lot of these uh, jihad-inspired uh, magazines, like in uh, Inspire, et cetera, talking about kind of terrorist playbook and what you need to do. And that's been widely distributed in terms of using vehicles to commit acts of terror. So this isn't something that just fell, you know, out of the terror lap. No, yeah, you're absolutely right. And so this has been something that's been going on for quite some time. And you have never heard anyone from the left really come out and condemn Islamic supremacy. Uh, when you look at the terrorist attacks that have happened here in the United States of America, you know, Fort Hood with Major Nadal Hassan is mm -hmm. still classified as workplace violence. The president of the United States of America never said anything about the Chattanooga attack that killed five of our sailors and Marines on a Naval Reserve installation. When you look at Orlando and San Bernardino, there was no accepting that this was an Islamic supremacist attack or a jihadist attack. It was about gun control. So I really find it very, you know, disgusting and deplorable, the obfuscation, the dismissal and denial, because if it does not fit into their ideological agenda or their talking points, they're not going to stand up for it. All right, yeah, obfuscation and denial, two of the most powerful weapons, uh, you know, that they use. And if I can just get your quick comments on the departure of Steve Bannon and the impact you might think that it has on President Trump's administration. Well, I think that what will remain to be seen is in the next 30 to 60 days, what will be Mr. Bannon's actions? Will he fight strongly for the administration from the outside, mm -hmm. or will he take a different approach? And that will let us know under the terms by which he was separated. All right, excellent. Lieutenant Colonel Allen West, always a pleasure to have you on the program. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kimberly. My pleasure. And coming up, the controversy over Confederate monuments is heating up as liberals call for the removal of more statues. James T. Harris, Charlie Kirk, and Doug Schoen join us next as this special edition of Hannity continues. Welcome back to the special edition of Hannity. In the wake of the violence in Charlottesville, several U.S. cities have begun removing Confederate statues and symbols. Maryland has now removed a statue of the U.S. Supreme Court Justice who wrote the 1857 Dred Scott decision. And in Arizona, the Jefferson Davis Memorial was literally tarred and feathered. Joining us now with Reaction, radio talk show host James T. Harris and Fox News contributor and Democratic pollster Doug Schoen and founder and executive director of Turning Point USA, Charlie Kirk. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me sure. tonight on this uh, explosive mm -hmm. issue that continues to grip the Thanks nation. For me. James, I'm going to begin with you. So, President Trump earlier this week said that the issue of Confederate statues and monuments should be an issue that is best left to the states and to the cities. Do you agree? Yes, I do agree. I mean, before I was a radio talk show host, I spent uh, 10 years as a high school history teacher, and I taught my students, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly of history. And there's lessons in this. And I look at what's happening across the nation today with the taking away of Confederate monuments in horror because of important lessons that can that are being lost, the you know, opportunities to teach about how to avoid these mistakes that we made in the past. All right, Doug, now you uh, recently said an op-ed that sure. President Trump should give an Oval Office address to bring the American exactly. people together. What should he say in that Oval Office address were he well, to give it? He needs to say, Kimberly, that we are one nation, one people. We're not Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives. We need to move past these symbolic issues, however wrenching, talk about tax reform. We need to talk about infrastructure and fixing health care. <clears throat> Excuse me. We need, in short, 
to talk about the real problems mm -hmm. and the challenges overseas from nations like Iran and North Korea. We can't get mired down in talking about, you know, Confederate monuments. I, I, I think we should leave it to localities. I don't like them. But the larger issue is who we are as a people and how we move forward, not, not symbolic politics. Okay. And, you know, Doug, there's been some polling on that. I want to stay with you for a moment. 62% uh, of Americans, according to a recent poll, believe that the Confederate monuments should stay. Um, is it a losing issue for the Democrats? And yet you also say that, you know, the president should sort of redirect and talk about other well, issues instead of focusing on it. I, I would say, Kimberly, it's a losing d issue for everyone. I, I respect Southerners and the majority of Americans who don't want to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, they are symbols of racism and oppression, and I don't really think they have a place. But the larger issue is to focus on our real problems that we face now and our adversaries here, our problems at home, and to not do what Steve Bannon's saying he's going to do, go to war. I say come together. Come together. So more a uh, message of unification, yes. Charlie, than divisiveness and trying to tear monuments down and the country I apart. I Okay, Charlie. Well, I agree with Doug. I, I, I think that it is the time for unification, and it's best left to the states and the localities. Unfortunately, this is an issue that's only going to get bigger. There are left-wing activist groups that are going to, they're not going to rest until every single Confederate statue or name is removed from everywhere. So there has to be a position to... that is made, unfortunately. And one last point on this that's really important. I think there is this implicit or explicit war on the South, and we have to take a step back. Look, 40% of the active U.S. military is from a collection of 11 states. And those states are south of the Mason-Dixon line. And this, this war on everything Southern is, is wrong. And I'm, I'm going to disagree that these monuments are not symbols of racism. Some oh, are, but some are, are more, some are, are just remembering the valor and the bravery of the people that put forth their lives and their time to a cause that they found noble. And so I will say, unfortunately, this issue is only going to get bigger. I wish we were talking about infrastructure and jobs right. and taxes and government overreach. But this is an issue that the left wants to keep talking about. James? The left, is trying, the left is trying to destroy our culture, they're trying to destroy our nation. And we need to be very careful about sitting in judgment of the past because the future is going to sit in judgment of us. We're literally Correct. enslaving our, our kids, you know, with hundreds or trillions of dollars of debt. We have uh, our inner cities are blowing up. We are looking at, you know, uh, 300 or millions of people who have been aborted. And what will the, the, the future say about us when we erect monuments to ourselves? What They're going to be tearing them, tearing them down. We need to be very, very careful of uh, sitting in judgment of the past. These monuments are very important. There's very important lessons. The Democrats right. can learn from, Jeff, uh, from General Lee, mm -hmm. who, after he was defeated by the Union, decided, you know what, I'm going to work with them as trying to join a resistance or to try to join some type of uh, a guerrilla warfare. These, right. these are important lessons that need to stay put. All right, Doug, real quick. These are uh, really heartfelt sentiments, but they're dead wrong to me. We come together, we put the past behind us, we study it, but we don't relitigate it. We don't need monuments to slavery and oppression. We need concerted and constructive action on health care, on job creation, on our, our adversaries overseas. That's what's important. That's what the president should focus on. All right, and the nationwide debate continues. Gentlemen, James and Charlie and Doug, thanks so much for being Thank with you, me. Kimberly. And coming up, will President Trump pardon Sheriff Joe Arpaio? Greg Jarrett says he might. He joins us next. That and much more as the special edition of Hannity continues. Welcome back to the special edition of Hannity. President Trump is making news over the possibility of pardoning former Arizona Sheriff Joe Arpaio, who was found guilty of criminal contempt last month. In a recent exclusive interview, President Trump told our colleague, Greg Jarrett, quote, I am seriously considering a pardon for Sheriff Arpaio. He has done a lot in the fight against illegal immigration. He's a great American patriot, and I hate to see what has happened to him. And in an interview with NPR yesterday, Arpaio said he would be honored if President Trump does decide to grant him a pardon. Here with reaction is Fox News anchor and attorney Greg Jarrett. Uh, Greg, congratulations on getting that interview sure. with the president. A lot of people talking about this because of the upcoming um, right. you know, trip. What do you think um, the outcome of that is going to be and the likelihood of the president issuing a pardon? You know, I would say there's a better than 50 percent chance that on Tuesday when the president speaks at the Veterans Memorial Coliseum, mm -hmm. huge venue, um, that he may take the opportunity then, in front of a very friendly crowd, to pardon Joe Arpaio. Maybe Arpaio will be there. I don't know. But when I spoke to the president, 
I mean, he really was very moved by the circumstances of this misdemeanor conviction. Of Sheriff Joey felt it was unfair that uh, you know it was a political prosecution that began in the Obama administration's Department of Justice. I've looked at a lot of the record on that conviction, and it is very, very questionable. I mean, Arpaio said, "Look, I simply followed the advice of my lawyer at the time, right. who did not." provide me with all of the restrictions contained in the order. I looked at the order itself. It's vague and ambiguous and really kind of hard to decide what the restrictions are. If you had put this case in front of a jury, and it probably should be in front of a jury, mm -hmm. since jail time is the penalty, um, he would have been acquitted, I'm, I'm pretty certain. So I, I think the president will probably go ahead and pardon or a pile. You know, it's, again, it's a misdemeanor. So we're talking about small potatoes. Here. And maybe at this event where you said it's a very, you know, warm welcoming in terms of a supportive uh, constituency that would be in favor of this. Yeah, you know, um, the president has a real connection with Arizona, the Grand Canyon State. It was, uh, he made seven visits there. Mm -hmm. And it was really the first big venue of the cheering crowds that helped launch his candidacy for president. And it's true he only won by 3.5% over Hillary Clinton, but, you know, Arizonans really do like Donald Trump. Um, Representative Trent Franks, who heartily endorses a mm -hmm. pardon, is going to be there. I mean, he has a lot of fans, and I think this may be the time he pardons our pile. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not like... Would there be political fallout from that? Because some have said, oh, no, poor Joe Arpaio, because it looked like he was going to get it. But then in light, in the aftermath of Charlottesville and the racial mm -hmm. tensions and sort of what's been boiling over in yeah. the country, when you kind of put those two in the juxtaposition of them both, is the timing not as favorable Oh, as it will be for his many critics and the liberal media. It doesn't matter what the president does. They'll always criticize him. And I think he realizes that. Um, and it's not like, I mean, compare it to the last president, President Obama, who commuted the sentence of Chelsea Clinton, mm -hmm. uh, Chelsea Manning, excuse yeah. me, at, who stole 750,000 documents, classified documents, leaked them, did damage to national security and the military. You compare Serious it to crime. that yeah. and criminal misdemeanor you know, is minor compared to what Obama did in commuting the sentence of Chelsea Manning. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't think the president's going to be moved by what the, uh, the liberals or the mainstream media think about a decision that he might make. Right. If he feels strong and passionate about it, he's going to do, do what he wants. And the president really did feel that, um, you know, Arpaio did not, was not treated fairly by this court system mm -hmm. and that he has done so much. The president said, he has uh, stopped a lot of crime and st saved lives. And he said, is there anybody in local law enforcement who's done more to halt illegal immigration than Sheriff Cho? And the president answered his own question and said, absolutely not. Mm, wow. Okay. Well, that's excellent. And you spoke to the man directly, so I you did. would know his right. personal thoughts on it. Greg, always a great job. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Coming up, 